pleasure of speaking for Mother's Day today, and I'm glad we have some men in the group though. It's so what I'm teaching is going to apply to mothers, people that want to be mothers, people who are mothers to other people, and to men too. So don't give up just because it's a Mother's Day message. So probably all of us have searched for significance in our life. Raise your hand if you have. We, we feel like we were made to have an impact on the world. We're not just made to kind of go through life and um, do our job, have a family, and then that's it. We think we're made for something significant. Or maybe it's just me and Danny that feel that way <laughs> because um, we don't feel like we're just here for to fill up the earth. When we get to heaven, we don't want God to say, you did an okay job. You did 50% of your destiny or your purpose. Or we don't want to get to heaven and have him say, oh, wow, you came pretty close. You reached 75% of your destiny. We want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So some of us are busy young mothers, nobody in here, but um, you're just trying to make it through the day. You're busy with the family. You just want to keep your kids alive. And so you can't even think about your destiny at that point. Some of us are working full-time jobs and we're busy at the job or especially a teacher. Because I remember when I was a teacher, I had so much planning to do. I'd stay up till like 11 or 12 just to go give a lesson that went over like a lead balloon. So I know about being busy and it's hard to go, when I'm retired, I'm going to reach my destiny. And then some of us in here are more mature. And I agree, I'm in that category too. And we think, is there even enough time in our life to fulfill what our destiny is or the purpose that God gave us? So I've got good news. It's not all about filling our destiny. I know that might come as a shock to you, but it's all that in-between stuff too. What it took to get there in the first place. Mm -hmm. It was part of his intent to do all these things that we're doing in between. And sometimes we might fail at it and sometimes we don't. And I'm not talking about works. I'm talking about ministering to people, serving people, giving a cup of water to someone who thirsts. Was our destiny really about the lives we touched along the way? Maybe that's what you meant all along. The lives that touched us, raising kids, discipling our hairdresser, <laughs> serving at church, or even giving a sermon at church when you don't feel like you're much of a public speaker. <laughs> Was the stuff in between how we spent our intimate time with the Lord as we planned to fill the destiny, was it as important as the destiny? Was the stuff in between when we gave love to others, when we gave a cup of water in his name, when we gave someone a roof over their head, was that part of completing our destiny? Is the race itself as important as actual winning of the race? And so now I gave this verse to someone, 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. And everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim, I box in such a way as not without, as though not beating the air. I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest possibly after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. So I know you hear this and you think, well, it's about winning, though. He wants us to win. But it, at first it sounds like only one person is going to win. And I don't think that's the way it is. I think part of our winning is because of the stuff we did in between, because we were obedient. Like Nietzsche said, along obedience in the same direction. And I know someone else had a book title by that, but it originally came from Nietzsche. So now we have 1 Corinthians 9.23. 1 Corinthians 9.23, and I do all things for the sake of the gospel, that I become a fellow partaker of it. Right, so it's not just that final goal that we're to reach. It, it's that we're partaking in it all the all the while, all through life. And now we have 1 Corinthians. Paul goes on to say, Therefore, my beloved brethren and sistren, too, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. So it's not about works, but it's about doing what the Lord has you do in, in your life as you go along, even if you're, it doesn't seem like it's part of your destiny. Maybe it is. Now we have Ephesians 4, 1 through 2. 
I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love. Okay, one of the key words besides love, because that's how we are supposed to live our life, is the word walk. So when, it, when you hear walk, you're picturing it happening in an ongoing way, not just, I jumped into my destiny, but I, you walked it out till you had that destiny complete. And I think he gives us the destiny, partly because he wants certain things done in the world, but also because he wants you to have something to aim for as you're walking out your life and as you're achieving that destiny. Now we have, oh, besides giving us instructions on how to live, notice the word walk. It's a process. So Ephesians 5, 2. And walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. And I just love that um, metaphor of being a fragrant aroma. So it's one that draws people to you. Mm. And what you're operating out of is love as you're walking. Genesis 3.8. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So even the God of the universe takes walks. He, he walks out things. He's not always up there, I'm going to put in a world borealis over here and, and down in Argentina and it'll look really cool down there. And I'm going to cause the earthquake. He's, or I'm going to meet this person's need. He, he isn't always busy. Sometimes he just wants to walk intimately with us. Yes. Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So there we have it again, walking along, walking out your life. Even if our destiny happens, we can't forget about the process that brought us here. You can't win the race without running the race. When I was a young mother, a friend gave me this beautiful book here, and here I am with my book review again, like I've done in a lot of my other sermons. It's called The Invisible Woman, When God, when Only God Sees, Nicole Johnson. It was just monumental to me at that time, because I was a young mom. I was working at Seattle Christian School's library. I was raising a family, going through a lot of stuff. The subtitle, again, is When God Only Sees. The author tells a fictitious story about a woman named, believe it or not, Charlotte, <laughs> who represents all women, especially young mothers who struggle with feelings of being invisible or like their lives don't matter. Here's an excerpt. I've often wondered when my kids walk into the kitchen if they just see a pair of hands cooking a meal. Maybe I'm like the white-gloved hamburger helper hands. Remember those? Yes. yes. <laughs> now it seems kind of creepy. Or do they see an apron tied around an invisible waist, standing over the stove? Some days I'm only a pair of hands, nothing more. Can you fix this? Can you tie this? Can you open this? Can you wash this? Weren't those the same hands that held books, went to college, and even received a law degree? I feel like a missing person that no one will miss. I'm the only one who would notice my picture on the back of a milk carton. <laughs> <laughs> So this woman, this fictitious person, but in reality represents a lot of women. Even if we don't have children still at home, we might be so busy. We kind of feel like, did that go unnoticed? I sat in a car with some friends once, and Danny and this friend of ours was in the front, and he was talking, and then I interjected something, and there was this brief, brief pause, and then he went on, and I was still like, I don't think they even heard me. Have you ever done that before? And you say something, the conversation's going on, and like... Yep. Nobody even knows I'm here. Yeah. So the main character had dinner with a friend and, and downloaded with her. I feel like I'm invisible. My husband doesn't see me. All they see are the things that I do. So the friend said, Charlotte, you are asking a question that only you can answer for yourself. The question is, do I matter? Don't many of us wonder, am I doing the right thing? thing? Am I spending my life well? We don't want to get to the end of our life and feel like, oh, I didn't really spend that life I was given very well. Charlotte's friend returned from a trip to Europe and brought her a book about cathedrals. Her inscription read, with admiration for the greatness of what you are building when only God sees. So the title of this sermon is Building Cathedral Builders. Cathedral Builders. Here's this shortened version of the book. So this is like a book within a book within a sermon. We've got the sermon. We've got the book, and then the lady receives a book about cathedrals and talks about that. And it's monumental to 
changing her life and monumental to mine too when I read it. Here's the shortened version. A period of 300 centuries from 1050 to 1350, several million tons of stone were quarried in France for the building of cathedrals. More stone was ex excavated than any time in ancient Egypt. Some of the architects and bishops behind a few of these great buildings were known, and much credit is given them for their work. But the vast majority of labor, the masonry, the carpentry, the stained glass was all done by people whose names history will never reveal. So here's some summarize some things she and I both learned about from this cathedral book. We have no record of the builders' names. Some of them we do know, and some of the architects we know, but not the people that did the hard labor. And many of them were monks also that didn't want to just stay and think intellectually about the Lord in their monastery, but they came to work. And so their work was a prayer. Two, these builders gave their whole lives for work they would never see finished because most of them took a hundred years or more to make. So they're not even see the final product. Maybe their children will, maybe their great grandchildren. Three, they made great sacrifices and expected no credit. I'm assuming most of them did it with joy. You know, it, this is, was a big project. We're all working together. The joy of making a building for the Lord that's so beautiful. The passion of their building was fueled by their faith that the eyes of God saw everything. Five, many cathedrals took over 100 years to build. That means many won't even see it finished, which I gave to you out of order here. One of the stories in the cathedral book tells the story of a wealthy man who observed a workman carving a tiny bird on the inside of a bee. He asked the worker, why are you spending so much time carving that bird into a bean that will be covered by a roof? The workman replied, because God sees. Mm -hmm. Centuries after the cathedrals were built, beautiful statues have been found hidden behind some of the walls. The only way to see the statue is through a hole in the plaster and by putting a mirror with a handle inside so you could see the reflection of the statue. They believed God saw their statues and they were for his eyes only. So they weren't afraid no one would see their work because the one who mattered the most had already seen it. Wow. You guys start to figure out where I'm going with all this. Then the book's character heard this. And I think this is for all of us here and those of you who are listening to the recording. God says, I see you. When Hagar was in the desert and she was pregnant by Abraham and she's kicked out and she, she was there and God said, I see you. And, God, and Jesus said to Nathaniel, I saw you when you were sitting under the fig tree. And this blew Nathaniel away because he, did, he was not, he was kind of hesitant, didn't really want to believe things or didn't believe that anything good could come from him. Uh, Nazareth, and then Jesus prophetically spoke over him and seen him sitting there. So he sees us. I see your tears of disappointment when you feel overlooked or when things don't go the way you want them to, but you are building a great cathedral and you cannot possibly see right now what is what will ultimately become. It will not be finished in your lifetime and you will never be able to live there, but if you build it, I will. God will see it. Hebrews 6.10 is very encouraging about this aspect. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people. Many times at the end of the day, I wonder where all the time went. I haven't spent any time writing on the book Danny and I are working on. My house is clean, but I have worked, haven't worked on my destiny. I've spent uplifting time with a friend. Has this pushed me forward to my destiny? If I think I haven't spent my time wisely, Maybe I should ask God what he thinks of what I did with my time. Did I encourage someone? Did someone encourage me? Did I make a home look inviting and peaceful for my guests? Did I spend intimate time with Jesus reading his word and listening for his voice? Since junior high, when I wrote the story, Bear in the Bathtub, this polar bear used to take ice baths and met a little boy, that's the story goes, I wanted to be a writer. I believe God has a purpose for me too. I was so excited to have two of my short devotionals included in a 365-day devotional called A Cup of Comfort Devotional by James Bell and Stephen Clark. It came that day when I went to Barnes & Noble and searched for my published book. Well, my one 
out of three, two out of 365 contribution to it. I found it in Barnes & Noble and then looked through it where I found my entries and my bio in the back with my name. I was so excited. I wanted to go, I'm, I'm a published author. Hey, everybody in the store, I'm a published author. But I didn't do that. I just kind of sat there and go, I wish I could share this good news with somebody. So I texted my sister. Instead, I looked around. And there was no one to tell. And did it matter? I was finally taking steps toward my purpose. But is that the only thing I should aim for? <clears throat> What about the other purposes that come between me and my destiny? All the little things only God sees. Nicole Johnson summarizes the cathedral building so well in this quote. The author also discovered that there were advantages to being invisible. She was able to make real love visible by her invisibility. Doing things people didn't even realize. Doing things behind the scene. <clears throat> when she was less visible, the world could see the living God who sees them. And how invisible are we when someone else gets the credit for what we did too? Are we able to just, that's okay, God. You still, they still saw it happen. <clears throat> Am I saying that we should only care about everything else except our purpose? No, our purpose is important. Our destiny, our dreams. I'm using those three words interchangeably. That is wise advice. Aiming our goal, aiming at our goal is important. Let's not forget the stuff in between. Oh, good. I have somebody reading a really long passage right now. Mark 10, 42. <laughs> In the Passion <clears throat> Translation, it says, Those recognized as rulers of the people and those who are in top leadership positions rule oppressively over their subjects. But this is not the example you are to follow. You are to lead by a different model. If you want to be the greatest one, then live as one called to serve others. The path to promotion and prominence comes from comes by having the heart of a bond slave who serves everyone. For even as the Son of Man did not come expecting to be served by everyone, but to serve everyone, and to give his life as a ransom price in exchange for the salvation of many. Okay, this isn't a works verse, but this is about us being a bond servant to Jesus and where we want to serve other people too, as an example. And that's that's the correct kind of leadership, the Lord says, is we lead by serving. <clears throat> Some of you have seen the movie Cabrini. Mm -hmm. In fact, two of you went with me when I saw it, and I've, saw, I've seen it twice. Have you seen it? I'm waiting. It's really good. Um, so it's the awe-inspiring movie of an Italian nun who, who came to early America to help the homeless Italian orphans and the Italian people were treated so badly back during this time, <clears throat> late 1800s, I think. She didn't set, set out to find sainthood. She had an unquenchable desire to help desperate children. Mother Teresa did not set out to accomplish great things for the Lord. She saw the needs of orphans, mm -hmm. of the poor, of the destitute, and sought to meet their needs. Now she's an example to many of sacrificial love. They didn't set out to make that purpose, but it happened. They just started out with the goal of me. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, and some of these verses you read were in the Passion. This one is too. There are three things that remain, faith, hope, and love, yet love surpasses them all. So above all else, let love be the beautiful prize for which you run. How many have seen the movie Mr. Holland's Opus? <clears throat> it's been a long time since we've seen it. Yep. So at first I'm going, what, what is an opus? And a uh, magnum opus would be like your best, the best music you ever wrote or your best artwork that a person has done. <clears throat> so the movie was starring Richard Dreyfuss, who did an outstanding job. He was a musician who dreamed of writing his magnum opus, the greatest or most important work of a musician. To make ends meet, he began teaching band at a high school. Throughout most of the movie, Mr. Holland taught with a heart, gave students direction for life, helped his deaf child fill music, and let me say that one again, that's going to sound funny on the tape, helped his deaf child fill music, and showed love to his students. All of these life situations took time away from him writing his big opus. At the end of the movie, Mr. Holland's last concert, students played his opus that he'd finally been starting to work on. That's when we realized that the real opus, the real accomplishment, was in what he did for his students and family, mm, yeah. not in the opus. 
Titus 2.7 Above all, set yourself apart as a model of a life nobly lived. The influence of a single person cannot be underestimated. In 1885, Edward Kimball, a Sunday school teacher for young men, felt the tug to share his faith with a young shoe salesman. The shoesman's name, shoe salesman's name was Dwight L. Moody, who became an evangelist. Many of you have heard of him, and he started a school. A young college student, Frederick B. Meyer, heard Moody preach, so he became an evangelist. A young college student heard, named William Chapman heard F.B. Meyer preach and was inspired by him. So he employed a baseball player to preach alongside of him. <clears throat> the baseball player's name was Billy Sunday. Oh. Billy Sunday held an evangelistic campaign in Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh. Out of that revival, men in Charlotte got together to pray for the world and especially for Charlotte, North Carolina. God sent, sent them a man named Mordecai Ham. Not a lot of people were being saved at the uh, crusade that Mordecai Ham was putting on until the last evening. On that night, a young man stepped forward to receive Christ. His name was Billy Graham. <laughs> and so if you start with Edward Kimball, a Sunday school teacher, we don't even know what his occupation was, that he witnessed to that first person, Dwight L. Moody, and look at the chain of events. Yes. It's estimated that Billy Graham led 215 million people to the Lord. 2.2 billion have heard his messages. There was another man who played a part in Graham's salvation, a farmhand on Billy's parents' farm in North Carolina, persuaded 16-year-old Billy to go to the revival led by Mordecai Ham. We may never know the influence we have on earth. So all of those people could have done what they were so, supposed to be doing and, and bringing others to the Lord and evangelizing, but it also took that farmhand to get to inspire Billy Graham to go to the crusade in the first place. So every life we touch makes a difference. To keep my teaching certification up to date, I'm required to take classes. So even though you went to school all those years, and even though you're teaching students and learning there, you have to still take classes to keep the certification. In one particular class, we uh, learned about how to teach kids writing. And this was creative writing mostly and how they could get their emotions out on paper. And in this one particular incident, the teacher of the teachers said, I want you to write um, stream of consciousness writing, just whatever comes out of your head about your dreams. And I interpreted that to me like our, our goals we've always wanted. So here's what I wrote. And remember, this was just kind of stream of consciousness. So it's not complete sentences. Don't hold that against me. Age spots of experience, just the outward, not the inward. Wrinkles showing the frowns, the joy, the disappointment. I wear the grooves of a challenging but well-lived life. I have purged, purified uh, feeling after passing through the gauntlet of life's expectations. The satisfaction of having made it through. Now I was one of the older teachers there, so they're writing about their future and I'm kind of writing about my past. Mm. How can I feel satisfied even if my true dreams never come to pass? How can I feel satisfied when a backpack of bricks, responsibilities, duties, survival have kept me from my dream? The weightiness of expectations, marriage, childbirth, children, runny nose, noses, emergency visits, shaping little beings of my own into responsible adults with their own dreams fulfilled. The weightiness of teaching the children of others, giving them skills so they become responsible adults with their own dreams fulfilled. Has this backpack of bricks been a burden? Or were they my actual dreams I didn't know I had? Mm -hmm. Those responsibilities that seemed so overwhelming at the time now leave me refreshed as I reminisce. They seem like a tickle <laughs> that starts in the pit of my stomach and bubbles up through my mouth and forms a contented smile on my face. As my grandchildren run up to me, I engulf them in my wrinkly age spotted arms. Could it be that my dream I thought I had, which was never met, wasn't my real dream at all? Was the real dream actually reached by living out my life, by loving others, and pouring myself out for them? Mm. And so, final word. Pursuing our destiny, the purpose God has called you to, is vitally important. And we, don't, we do want to carve out time for it. I'm not saying don't head towards your destiny. That is not what I'm saying. We must also remember that we are part of the big picture 
and we're a part of the details. Mm -hmm. We are cathedral builders who work hard as unto the Lord. We may never see the completion of our destiny, but let's not forget all the in-between stuff when we love others, where we serve others, where we are Jesus with skin to someone who needs to know that God sees them. So. <laughs> 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 <laughs>